attention, but right. The conservation of yes. momentum is similar to the conservation of linear momentum with somewhat similar logic. And what is the logic? So logic is torque. The definition of torque, which is torque about any point O or about any axis is equal to rate of change of angular momentum about that axis or a point. So in a plane, generally we talk about point, but in in general, in three dimensional world, we take talk about an axis. Our syllabus is confined to plane motion, as I have discussed. So in case of plane motion, we have everything as axis. So now <clears throat> This relation, which is saying that torque is equal to dl not by dt, this is very, very important. And why this is important? So the angular momentum definition about the point, if you remember, had two terms. The first was m into the position vector of center mass plus velocity of center mass, and we call this as orbital angular momentum, if you remember. And what also I said that this is due to the fact that the observer is present somewhere. So there is unsaid mention of observer when we talk about the orbital angular momentum. <coughs> so in case of atom, if you remember the Bohr's postulate that the angular momentum is quantized, the angular momentum in the Bohr's postulate was uh, uh, without saying orbital angular momentum. At the same time, it was with respect to the center of the circle. So the center as an observer was somewhat unsaid. It's implicit. It's not explicit. So without the observer, there is no question of the first term. And therefore, the first term is manipulable. So you can manipulate. So <clears throat> a, a nice choice of observer can eliminate the first term and will make the entire angular momentum really simple. The second term, <clears throat> second term has nothing to do with the observer. It's a Purely the property of the body. And uh, if you remember, we call this as spin angular. <coughs> now, the definition of torque is not I alpha. That's uh, when for many students, they believe that torque is I alpha. And in fact, when we were solving, also we were using the torque of alpha. That's not the real. So let's differentiate the equation number one, and then we'll see that what is torque actually. So if we differentiate with time, then what we get is m d by dt of R C cross V C plus. Okay, I mean here again, the I C M could be a variable. So things can be really complex. In fact, mass can also be variable, but I'll, I'm keeping the mass as constant for the differentiation, else I will have many, many terms. So if I keep the ICM constant, in that case, uh, things will be just like this. Let me mention this, what I'm assuming here. Assuming M and I as constant. Now the ICM could be a different value. It could be a, a variable. And in fact, there was a question in IITJ subjective exam, long time back, not now, maybe, maybe five to six years back, in which JE asked this question that when I was the variable. So, if you come across that question, you will remember that okay, ICM could be a better. And to deal with something very fresh, like if you have been asked some uh, question in the J advanced emission, 
and if you want to analyze from this scratch. So the basic method is this definition. You start from here, you differentiate. And then you get the generic definition of torque. So this is the definition of torque from motor point. Now let's differentiate the terms each. <clears throat> the first term will have a chain, I mean, product rule. So you have that uh, the D by DT of uh, RC cross VC. In case of a cross product or a vector product, the order should not be swept while doing the differentiation. You have to keep intact the order the way it is written. And this is a very, very important takeaway from a mathematical point of view. And the D omega DT, we call it alpha. So definitely torque is not I equal. So it is something more than that. The first term is called velocity by definition. Second term is velocity, but we know that Vc cross Vc is going to be zero. And here, this is the nice thing, see the AC itself, the center mass acceleration. And this term is zero. So the torque about a point O <coughs> is basically mass into RC cross AC. And what does it mean is that uh, the AC is the Position the RC is the position vector of the center mass with respect to O, and AC is the accession of center mass, but what you assume while solving it. So, this is the actual definition of torque, which is not I alpha. Now, how to get the <coughs> only this term, like how to avoid the first one? What we like, which point if we choose will make sure that torque about that point is only equal to the second term. So I have to make RC zero, right? Yes, sir. Because I'm not going to make AC zero. So the RC can be made zero in two ways. Or the first term can be made zero in two ways. First is if RC and AC are parallel. Understood. If RC and AC are parallel, then in that case, the first term will be zero. The second way is if I choose the center mass itself as the point of interest, so torque about a general point is something like RC cross. MAC plus ICM into alpha. And what I was trying to say that uh, to make the first term zero, there are two possibilities. So if we, so I mean, okay, look at the first scenario. Let's say this is a body, some body, random body, and this is the center mass. But you're trying to write the torque about a point somewhere here. Uh, a general. Yeah, you can write the property any point, not a big issue. Then this is called RC. So if you if you are writing the torque equation about a generic point, you will have two terms. Okay. And. Uh, what about the other way of writing? So what if I choose the, the axis here itself? If I choose axis here itself, now about this point, the RC will be zero because from center mass, how far is center mass? Zero. So if I change the O to CM, 
the torque about RCM will be how much? Zero cross MAC because RC from RC is zero plus ICM into alpha. And that is why this relation is always true, no matter which question you are solving, what kind of question is there. The center mass is the perfect choice because it will eliminate the first term anyhow. So when you start solving question of a torque, you are supposed to take a talk about center mass itself. But as I said, if you find a point which is hinge or a point which is kind of ICR having zero velocity, in such scenario, you may apply the equation as tau equals to i alpha, but tau will be the about the hinge and i will be the about the hinge. And the reason is simple because in such scenario, the alpha and AC will be correlated and therefore things will be easy for you. Understood? So by the parallel axis theorem, it will combine into a single formula, but not in general. So the takeaway here is that torque about center mass is ICM alpha always true. Torque about uh, any point is not equals to I about the point in alpha, unless, unless the point is hinged or I understand. So if that is the case, then of course you have a choice. Clear? Sir, so in that case, you can apply that formula. Yeah. Unless it means uh, torque about uh, any hinge is equals to I about hinge in the but this is true. Always. So the only possibility is like it should be now in while solving numerical. This condition you will meet many times, but uh, in all such cases you will stick to this method. If the body is not hinged and you are supposed to write the torque, then just write the torque about the center mass. You can leave the rest. It is not necessary that every body will be hinged. It is not necessary that every question will be of pure elimination. <coughs> so now coming back to the, the again the relation of torque and angular momentum. So the, there are two ways of thinking that if the angular momentum about the point O is changing, then there must be some torque present about that point. Or you can say if the torque is present, then it will change for sure. So the change in angular momentum about O is torque about O into D. If I integrate, this term we can say as delta L naught. And this term in physics, we call it H naught. This is called changing. This is obvious. And the second term is called angular impulse. Because if you know the definition of impulse, so earlier it used to be force into time. Now what we have? <coughs> torque into time. Torque into time. So there is there is a very, quite a similarity between what we studied earlier and this. So the angular impulse and change in angular momentum are uh, related to each other. So whenever there is an angular impulse, there is a change of momentum, and this is called angular. Impulse angular momentum theorem.
Now this could be written in some other way also. So let's talk about O equals to uh, into dt equals to dl naught and talk we if you remember the talk of that is r cross f. And of course, r is the position vector of the point of application of force with respect to the Choice of origin O. So this is kind of understood. And uh, this term, if I integrate now, this is exactly the impulse, the linear impulse. So this is the other way of writing the angular momentum, angular impulse theorem. So what we can write is the, the linear impulse multiplied with the r vector, the r cross j. This will be equals to change in angular momentum about that point, the O point. Okay. So this kind of uh, theorem will be very helpful to solve some of the challenging problems. So let me show you some problem which is based on this, and then we'll proceed to the towards the conservation principle. So I still I haven't done the conservation principle. Now, when this change will be zero, this change will be zero when this term is zero. So in a way, you can say that if the angular impulse acting on the body is zero, the angular momentum is conserved. So we'll come to that. Or if you can see that if the torque is zero about a given axis or point, then angular momentum about that point or axis will be conserved. I think we have discussed this part about the point and about an axis. So let's do, do one numerical problem to understand the angular impulse, angular momentum theorem. So for that purpose, we will take a, a, a thinking ball. Let's take a ball actually. And imagine this ball is, is spinning. This ball is spinning wow. with omega not velocity. So it's like a solid sphere. Just So, <clears throat> ah. so now this is ball, which uh, this is ball. So you can think as a solid sphere. And I hope you all have done this. So now I'm dropping by giving a spin. So you spin it and you drop it. And the height from which you drop is h. And this is a highly rough surface. Or maybe it just rough surface. Now, 
let's say the coefficient of friction between the ball and the ground is mu k the current friction it could be mu s also static as well <coughs> okay so when you drop a ball you must have seen that after hitting the floor it bounces back something like this correct so you are dropping vertically but it goes forward because of the spin which you give so how exactly this happens so you are not throwing forward but still after hitting the ground it is going forward so why it is happening so first of all it will fall by height h okay you know the size of the ball or you may consider so there are two possibility i will just call the r so if h is much bigger than r i can assume that the ball has fallen by h but if you take r as significant then i will say the ball is fallen by h minus r that's okay so we are ignoring the size of the ball compared to the h <coughs> and uh, <clears throat> we know what is the velocity with which it will impact the ground so when the ball will hit the ground it will have some velocity again for the sake of writing i'm drawing something like this so at the time of hitting the ground what is your velocity that you can easily calculate and the value of v not we can write as under root 2g h again i am saying assuming h is much bigger than r ignore the size of the ball take as a point not exactly point but yeah it's small enough so this is the velocity with which you will stack the ground this is the velocity with which ball will strike the ground all right let's say the coefficient of restitution is e but the coefficient of restitution works in the direction of common normal so it will decide the vertical component of velocity of the ball after it will hit e root to gh yeah so when you hit back when you hit the surface you will bounce back with only velocity e times v not so this is your vertical component of velocity <clears throat> but this is not important this is what we have discussed already in the center mass section and i can say that the j due to the normal action the jn will be m v not 1 plus e right if you remember the yes sir jn yes. part So this is the change in momentum. You just find the change in momentum in the vertical action that is equal to the impact due to normal. This is the impulse of normal. And the impulse of normal will act uh, like this. Perfect. If I do the impulse diagram, this is the impulse of normal. now what is interesting that as i said this is a rough surface <coughs> and not only rough sir but okay, let me give the spin a different direction because i want to be a little bit and because if the ball is spinning clockwise so the bottom of the ball will try to go which direction left or right left the tendency of the bottom is to go left and therefore the friction will act to right. right so now because of the spin given the friction will act right but because the normal is impulsive so the friction also becomes impulsive we call it jfk and again if you remember the center mass chapter then jfk the impulse of friction is mu times J. Let's call it mu. 
so i'm just dropping the k subscript to make it uh, look uh, a better way so in this expression jf is the impulse of friction and why i'm taking the impulse of friction because the normal at the instant is also impulsive so the friction will also become impulsive mu is the coefficient of uh, friction kinetic friction and j is the so now what happens this jf will create the horizontal component of this so we are just writing the impulse momentum theorem in the horizontal direction and therefore the ball will develop the horizontal velocity so the vertical velocity we know but it, because of the jfk it will also have the horizontal velocity let's call it v x now before the impact how much the v x was you can see the v x was zero and now this friction will develop some v x so now using impulse momentum theorem we can say something what we can say so we can say that uh, jf uh, equals to final momentum minus initial that is and jf is not difficult no it's mu jn and jn is known to us it's m u uh, m v not 1 plus e well we got v x also mu times uh, under root 2 g h 1 plus e that's interesting also you can see that the ball will have now horizontal component of velocity and the ball was spinning clockwise if you remember okay, it's a old story but i hope you remember the ball was moving clockwise right yes sir but something interesting happened here the if you look at all forces impulsive force or impulse basically you can say there are two impulses normal and friction and about center of mass one can create the torque isn't it which one so about center which uh, impulse can create torque the friction which, friction one friction force can create the torque and because the friction is capable of creating torque about center mass so it is also capable of and you can see that the friction is acting in a way to decrease the omega or increase omega is it supporting the omega or opposing the omega decreasing exactly so now omega not will again change to some new value omega so after the impact in the very short duration the jfk will change the omega not to omega almost in no time well how to find this new omega so here comes the rescue so the angular impulse angular momentum theorem about center mass will help you out and what you need to write is just multiply r with a j so okay let me put it here so r is r j is jfk so i'm just writing jf this is the angular impulse and it's very easy like you are not supposed to think much about center mass you are supposed to i mean apply the angular impulse angular momentum theorem and why because about center mass we have only spin we never have the orbital and that is why it is a common process or common uh, procedure or you can say practice you can say actually. to apply the angular impulse angular momentum theorem only about center mass because that will take away the burden of writing the first term so okay let me write on the next video because i think that should be put into words
So what we can say. <clears throat> apply angular impulse angular momentum about center of mass of ball v and it's very normal to understand what is happening about center mass what is the angular momentum initial so l about cm initial will be how much just icm into omega naught correct and because it is spinning clockwise i think yeah clockwise it must be like this now the lcm final is how much about center mass it is icm into omega and again surface. but if you look at that the angular impulse the h about center mass just a value you can see it is r into jf because that is clockwise the uh, interval so it is like a opposing force right so you had how to write you had this much angular momentum and H was the angular impulse was opposing this and you're left with only this much value. So in terms of writing, this is not difficult and you're only supposed to write about center mass. Don't write about any other point because that will be too dangerous to enter into that territory. So never ever, never ever dare to enter that territory. So as a beginner, I discourage explicitly so if you really master it on your own let's see if you realize that no i have mastered this entire concept okay you can enter. so there is a word of question here and now this is kind of known to us so i'm just leaving this part and the rjf jf was what new jn jn was what m v naught one plus so you see entire thing will change and you can see that the omega of the ball will change and in fact will decrease by the value so this is the new omega and this all happens in almost zero time because this is carried out by the impulsive force. And because it's a ball solid sphere, so ICM is 2 by 5 mR square. So omega turns out to be omega naught minus 5 mu by 2 R under 2 GH into MS. So fairly difficult question. But uh, the idea was not to teach you this question, the idea was to demonstrate that what is the use of angular impulse, angular momentum force. Now, should we expect this thing in the JE mains or NEET? The answer is definitely no. You should not expect at all. For J advance, 100% yes, you have to expect. So now, as a player, when you when you are a bowler, you, you have a choice. So there are something called the wrist bowlers. So <clears throat> let's play cricket on this screen. So cricket involves a lot of uh, idea from the physics mainly. And not a lot of all idea from physics. And apart from the statistics and the stats of a player. Which gives the history the weakness, which is the part of the data science. So coming back to the, the bowling part. So let's say you throw a ball, and there are many ballers who are risky ballers. So what they do is while throwing it, I mean, of course, they are the medium pressure, basically, they are mostly medium pressure. So how, what they do is they 
move the wrist at the last one to give a very high spin back. So when you throw a ball with very high spin, the forward spin, the bottom will tend to go backwards. You can see. So we have something called the flighted deliveries. So you give a flight, it means you don't impart a, a high velocity, but you throw at an angle which maximizes the range, which is like 45 degrees. So imagine that you have the expertise of throwing a ball at 45 degree angle. So then even though you will throw slowly, it will travel farther. So it will reach the batsman for sure. And then the, what you do next is you give a forward spin, a very high spin. So the ball looks like moving very slowly and batsman will be like uh, ready with the bat. But the moment it will hit the ground, the high spin will make sure that the friction will act forward. And this will create an impulse of friction. Of course, the chain is there. And therefore, the forward velocity will grow in value because of the friction. And once it will increase, once Oh, <clears throat> so now the, you can see the velocity. I mean, you must have thrown with some velocity UX, but the GF will support. So, in such scenario, after hitting the pitch, the ball will become faster and then it will deceive the batsman. So, you may swing your bat uh, anticipating the speed before, it, and uh, because the ball is fast, so there is a chance of. LBW because you, you are waiting for the ball and the ball has come suddenly. So the chance is that you may undergo LBW. You know, this is intention. But what happens if I do the reverse speed? So let's say you are a bowler who gives the ball a reverse spin, the back swing, we call it back spin. In such case, the bottom of the ball will be having forward velocity and the pressure will change the rise. So if you give a back spin, then the ball will in fact slow down after hitting the pitch. The chances it will slow down. And if it will slow down, you can see that the ball will come to you after hitting the pitch slowly. The chance that it will be like clean ball because your bat has swung before the ball has arrived. So now you know a lot of cricket using the basic concept of physics. Okay, this much for the cricket part. You can play other games using this. Okay. <clears throat> so now this was the one question that uh, explored uh, a lot of ideas into the world of uh, dynamics and physics. Apart from this, uh, in real life, we have to use the the Bernoulli equation called the Magnus effect. The wind speed is also taken for advantage by the bowler. And then you know how to play the in swing and out swing. So for the in swing out swing part, you have to wait till the fluid mechanics. I will tell you how the in swing happens and how the out swing happens. Anyway, so coming back to the question of uh, uh, angular momentum again. Angular impulse, angular momentum theorem is uh, not widely used by student, but if you develop the ability to use it, many difficult or challenging problems can be solved with ease. And uh, just like torque, you have to make it impulse. So torque is R cross F. You think like the F dt will become J. So R cross J is the angular impulse that's it you can think of 
and uh, as the impulse general the impulse uh, changes the linear momentum this changes the angular momentum the only difference is that the angular impulse angular momentum theorem must be applied about center of mass to body not about any other point because that will be dangerous so just a note i can mention that if you wish to apply the angular impulse angular momentum theorem just apply about the center of mass and that's it so always apply angular impulse angular momentum theorem about center of mass okay <clears throat> so i think that is sufficient so now we can go back to the the numerical which are based on the conservation of angular momentum let me put a heading a formal heading So there are three variety of question will come to us first it will be conservation about a point conservation about an axis so about a point means when the torque about the point is zero we say that angular momentum about that point will be done so if i say torque about o is zero this implies dl o by dt is zero which implies l about o is conserved or constant for axis part we know how to write so when talk about some axis called z axis not z means the x y z some any axis is zero this implies that uh, dl z by dt is zero and this implies the lz is constant and the very common example was the, the conical pendulum example and the 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 ball example so we'll start with some question so we we'll start with the generally we take about the talk about the axis only so we have a very famous question we have a table in very much detail okay 
And now let's make a hole in the table. And from this hole, we have a thread. And at the end of the thread, we have a small object attached to it. So now you can see this thread is here and someone is holding this thread. And then what we do is at a distance, uh, maybe capital R, this ball is given a tangential velocity. Like this. So now the question is, uh, if I start pulling the thread below, the R will change. What will happen to the speed? Will it remain same or will it change? So first of all, we need to understand that uh, why this will change. So if you pull the object closer to the axis, to the center, what do you think the velocity will increase or decrease? Certainly. Will it remain the same? Pardon? Tell me. It will decrease. Saying, decrease. If I pull closer to the axis, it will decrease, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Okay, so if I draw the ABD of this uh, ball, then we have three forces, normal, gravity, tension. And then because it's kept on a flat surface, so can we say by default that normal is balancing the energy? Yeah, we can say that normal is balancing the energy. And apart from that, you can also say that the normal and mg are equal in not only in value, but they're also acting at the same point. So their tails are joined together. Therefore, the net torque that they will produce will be zero everywhere else because they are equal in value and opposite in direction. So they will never contribute in terms of net torque because they're acting at the same point. So whenever we have two forces, which are equal in value, then no matter which point you choose, the torque will be how much? Zero. So about every point, because it's a couple force and they are parallel, and we have when we have a couple force which are parallel, it never produces torque if they are collinear. So the normal and gravity are equal in value and are collinear, as you know acting at the same location in this case. And therefore, we can say that the torque produced will be zero because it is behaving as a couple force. But definitely the tension is not the couple force. So tension can produce torque, but if I choose a proper axis, let's say if I choose the axis If I choose this axis, then what we can say that the tension will also intersect this axis. And therefore, about this axis, not just normal and mg, even the tension cannot produce torque. So now what we can realize that about this axis, the net torque of every other force is zero. If I add all forces, 
about this axis then we can actually claim that about this axis the angular momentum must be conserved because there is no net torque so if i call the axis as z axis so since torque about z axis is zero therefore the angular momentum about this axis must be constant or conserved so what is the initial value of angular momentum about this axis so we know the how to write the angular momentum of a point mass for point mass we have only orbital right so the angular momentum about this axis in the very beginning will be how much it will be m after some time when thread is pulled downward so when the thread is pulled downward then what will happen the angular momentum will try to maintain its value so because r is decreasing so v has to increase to manage understood and we can prove it so because angular momentum is conserved the form conservation of angular momentum m v not capital r must be equals to m v small r so given the r we can tell you what is v and because the small r is bigger the uh, small r is smaller than capital r so the ratio is bigger than 1 and so the v is more than v not so as you bring the the mass closer to the the axis it will speed up in order to conserve the angular momentum so now you may ask that if the ball will speed up then it will have a greater kinetic energy so from where that extra energy has come and the answer is simple it is the work done by the agent who is pulling the thread because when the agent is pulling the thread definitely some work has been done by the agent and it is that work which has given to the the bob or you can say the part so in fact we can go to the concept of work energy from here as well to account for the change of kinetic energy to account for change in kinetic energy we can say that it is the work done because whenever there is a change of kinetic energy some energy must have been supplied to the the object by some agent and agent is obviously uh implicitly present in the question i mean of course it is not mentioned very explicitly but it is there so it is a work done by external agent in pulling the thread so the work done by the agent will be how much so it's also a new question for you so you can say change in kinetic energy so work done by agent 
is changing kinetic energy in, and this is equal to half m v square minus v naught square <coughs> and we have just realized that v is v naught into capital r by small r minus this and so we can write as half m v naught square whole into capital r by r whole square minus one so this could be a potential question as well so whenever you see a thread problem in which you bring something closer or something farther in order to conserve the angular momentum things will change so this could be a question like this uh, So this is a, a tube of pi tension. It's the same question, just frame differently. Example. So you can see that there is a conical pendulum and there is a tube through which the thread is passed. And right now it is spinning with length, let's make it capital A at an angle theta. And someone is keeping it uh, stationary by pulling the thread because tension is developed, so you have to hold it. This is the external agent. Okay. And now it is uh, it is uh, moving in a circle which makes an angle theta. The length of the thread, which is part of the pendulum, is capital L. So I think you know how to find the omega in, in case like this. So this is the conical pendulum. Now, after some time, the rope length is changed to a small l. So, if the rope length is changed to a small l, then what will be the, the angle, new angle? The question is if the length of conical is decreased to a small end, then find the angle made by the Pendulum with vertical. It means if I if I pull this. Maybe it's going to be wrong. Can you tell me, please? So if you make the pendulum size smaller, you can assume that initially the omega was omega, some value can call it omega one. Uh, omega naught 
which you can calculate omega not because omega not is uh, well known answer uh, correct but once you pull this length to is small l the omega will change to a new value let's call it omega and now this omega will be definitely g upon l cos alpha and what we are supposed to do is because if you look at the and if you remember the discussion that we had that about the axis the angular momentum is going to be constant right because there is no torque about the axis normal is trajectory but uh, gravity is parallel to the axis tension is passing through the axis and therefore the net torque is zero so in this case the only way to solve question is conservation of l about axis so i hope you remember this and how to write the angular momentum about the axis it is mvr a simple thing is m vr but uh, you can also write as something better because this uh, velocity is not given omega is given so you can write as i about axis into omega initial this will take care of the mvr thing because it's the mvr itself only i into omega z the fun value and the moment of inertia depends on the square perpendicular separation so what was the i initial m r square and r is l sin theta whole square into omega initial let's write omega not i'll just put let on it is omega so i omega equals to i omega and theta is given to us basically so the alpha you can find but uh, yes we have to write the hmm. it's very bad so what you can write here L square sine square theta L square sine square theta into omega naught, which is G by L cos theta. Equals to L square. Sin square alpha, and the omega will be g by l cos alpha. So not a nice expression, but anyway. <coughs> so let's say they may may give you alpha, and they may ask you the l value. That is possible. So you can square further. So you can say l power four sin power four theta. Into G by L cos theta <coughs> G will cancel out and the L cube sine power four theta upon cos theta is L cube sine power four alpha by cos. Okay, so we can leave that. List. Maybe they will give you something. They may ask you something. But the whole idea is we have to apply the conjunction of angular momentum. <coughs> then the question is how we really understand in the question that I have to apply. 
so whenever we have some axis and something coming closer coming going away so you have to you have to get decided that if something is coming closer to the axis or going away from an axis this is definitely the question of conservation of angular momentum generally this is a uh, thing which is we don't realize so we'll see something more detail <clears throat> so this is a very famous question the crawling and problem so what we have is a disk So let's say we have a disk, and uh, let me get the axis. So what I am assuming that this disk is free to move about this axis. without any friction so the hinge near the axis generally we have the axle and uh, we put the ball bearing so it can spin easily so imagine this is a the ball bearing kind of a setup is that near the axis which you don't see and which gives it the uh, flexibility to rotate about this axis maybe this is the pole and it is at rest so things which are given to us is the radius the mass all right now we have an insect this is the insect You can see there is a small insect of mass here, and the disc is not very heavy. It's also very small, maybe a, a plastic disc. And then, because of the friction, the insect starts crawling on the perimeter. Now, how to walk? To walk on this uh, surface, what this insect will do? It will press so the it, surface. It would push the disc. Correct. Back. No, push the direction. the question is if the insect is starts crawling with a relative velocity v not with respect to this then what will be the omega of this so again we know that for the insect the, the only force is normal and uh, gravity and friction but the friction is the internal force because if i choose the system as a disc and the insect then that force is purely internal <clears throat> and therefore we should not uh, bother about the internal forces while writing the torque now the weight of the disc will act at its center because that's the weight of the disc the normal 
will act on the the insect upward, but the normal on the disc will act below downwards. That's why it cancel out its way. The friction on the insect will act forward and on the disc backward. So again, it will cancel out its way. So the external force is only gravity, and we know that gravity is always parallel to the axis. Now, once we are sure that all forces are parallel to the axis, the axis is the right force for conserving the angular momentum. So what we can say that the angular momentum of the disc and the insect taken together is conserved about the axis, not individual. Why not individually? Because if you take individual object, then friction is able to create the torque about the axis, isn't it? And therefore, we cannot consider it. So now the question is simple. Can you do the conservation of angular momentum about the axis and tell me the omega? Do this question. Take some time. Then we'll come back to this. Is it small m v naught by capital M plus m small m by r? Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> that seems to be not correct. Somewhat wrong. I mean, the pattern is this way only, but not exactly this.
Anyone getting the answer? See, angular momentum is not something miracle. So before anyone trying to solve angular momentum question, you can actually analyze the situation using the laws of motion. So as I said, as the ant will try to crawl, it will push the the disk backward, and that friction will create a torque about the axis, and that will set the disk into rotation. Now as the Ant is crawling, the friction will be there, and so the torque and so omega will uh, be there. <clears throat> so now ant will push for the some time to gain the velocity v naught, and then it will move because of the inertia mostly. So the whole idea is you can feel it that the friction is the cause behind these entire changes, but uh, Instead of going back to the friction and applying something more fundamental, we can do it smartly by the concept of conservation of momentum. So you should think that conservation is a, as a principle is a shortcut, but that is built upon the very fundamental laws of motion. So laws of motion is always fundamental, and anything else is. Kind of a mathematical tool to deal with the same in a situation which is not very, um, where it's very difficult to apply the, the laws of motion. So, let me show you through the laws of motion and then I'll solve by the conservation of angular momentum. It's not <coughs> so. What I will use is method one. In fact, I will not go back to that basic called <coughs> conservation of uh, uh, Newton's laws of motion. What we will use is called angular impulse, angular momentum. Now, if you master the angular impulse, angular momentum theorem, then there is no question which you cannot solve with ease. So this is like the most fundamental way of solving problem. Of course, uh, the question which you will encounter in your examination, especially the, those who are only aiming for the JE means or need, the conservation is more than enough for solving any tough question. So the question will be like that. I mean, you can read the question and it will come to know okay, I have to conserve that. <clears throat> so, let me add on this momentum theorem. Now, when it comes to the angular impulse, angular momentum theorem, we apply about uh, uh, we apply about the axis and we apply for individual objects separately. So here we have the insect plus disc. So because we have two objects, <coughs> we are supposed to apply this for two different object separately. So before that also we need to understand that uh, as a result of the friction force, let's say that this sets itself into rotation with omega value. So let's say. So initially the disk having zero. So for disk, uh, let me write the angular momentum. So what was the angular momentum initially? initially? Zero. And we know that friction will create the rotation. How much? <coughs> so friction will create the rotation equals to R cross J, J of F, right? Because R is the distance from the axis to the friction force. Because the friction force on the disk is tangential, correct? And on the insect is forward. And why I'm writing J if not F? The reason is you press the ground for the first time to gain the velocity from zero to some value, and once you gain it, you just move out of initial. So this is the angular impulse part. This is the angular impulse part. So the impulse is F dt. So you apply the friction for time dt. This is the impulse. And because this is acting r distance away from the axis, so this is the angular impulse. You can in short, right like this. 
do you realize this or is it very difficult is this okay yes sir. now angular impulse is equal to what change in angular momentum of the disk about the axis so about the axis we know this is i cm omega because initially it was zero that's it and what is the icm of the disk <coughs> you can see that r uh, will cancel R will cancel out. So JF turns out to be how much? Now for insect, the relative velocity is given as V naught, not the ground coming. So for insect, first of all, what is the like angular momentum about uh, the axis or we can simply write for insect what is the linear impulse because it's a particle so we can also write the linear impulse so what is the initial momentum of the particle or the insect zero now jf is the linear impulse what is its net velocity so it turns out to be the net velocity is v naught minus omega in the ground field. Do you realize this? Yes, sir. Okay. And if you realize this, because uh, in writing the answer, we choose the ground frame value, not the, the relative. So what was given to us was the relative velocity. But when you write the answer, you have to write <coughs> And now, because we have the two relation for JF, we can compare. So we can say equation of one, we can say equation. Two. So just comparing the one and two or equating one and two. So what we can write is m r omega by two equals to small m understood and I think this is only so now this we can rearrange. M R omega by two plus M omega R equals to M B naught. So we can take omega R from one. So it's M by two plus omega is how much? But this can be written in a very nice way. V naught by R and I will take M below, so it will become one plus capital M by two. Okay. So is this answer you got? Yes. Okay, let me start. So now Method two. Conservation of angular momentum. Now that will take care of the internal force because the friction is internal force. So we need to understand like how we must consider the system which can take away those forces which can possibly create the torque about the axis. And from the analysis, uh, you might have realized that it was the friction which was creating the torque. And it was developed between the insect and the disc. 
So choosing the insect and the disk as one system will eliminate the friction as a external force, rather it will make it internal. And therefore, the net contribution towards the axis will be again zero. Which will make sure that the angular momentum of the disk plus ant or insect is conserved, but not individual. So the angular momentum of the disk is not conserved. That's true. <coughs> the angular momentum of the ant is not conserved. That's true. What is conserved is the sum. And why it is conserved? Because in a way, they spin in the opposite sense. So the insect will create the angular momentum in one sense by subtracting the angular momentum of the disk in the other sense. So when you move in the opposite sense, then you have a negative. If I take first as positive, the other is negative. So it is like a loss of one is the gain of other. Okay. And the net gain is zero. It's like just like the loss and gain concept. So I can say that the ant has gained this much MVR angular momentum about the axis. The disk has lost this much because it's turning opposite. And the net is zero. It's the same thing. Like you conserve the angular momentum and you write the way, it's the same thing. This is one way, this is the loss gain approach. I can say loss gain. The other way is you just add blindly like uh, mechanically conservation formula. So what you write is initial was zero for the disc, zero for the insect equals to the L of disc final plus L of insect final. So initial everything is zero and you write the final, so you write zero equals to, now this is very mechanical, in which you don't have the relation what is happening, but you're writing somehow blindly so that you can get the answer and some marks. But the disk, I have to take care of the action. <coughs> so from the top view, the disk will turn clockwise. So I can add IC, omega clockwise. Insect is a particle, and we are trying to write the angular momentum of a particle, it's only orbital. The disk center mass is not translating, so there is no orbital. So we have only a spin. How to think? For body, you have to think of spin plus orbital. For particle, you have to think of only orbital. First of all, you have to develop this thinking process. Luckily, for this, we have only spin, no orbital about the axis, the axis is like fixed axis. Particle is just particle, the insect is like a particle of point mass. For point mass, we write orbital only. And because <coughs> to write orbital, we need to write a mass, velocity in the ground plane into the distance from the axis, and the sense is opposite. Because they have the opposite sense, so we can take one as positive, then other is negative or vice versa. You can take this as negative, this as positive. And then <clears throat> you write the formula minus m r square by 2 m v naught minus omega. This R will cancel out and it's uh, same answer. Of course, it will be same in this. So no matter how you think, how you approach mechanical, here, when you write a mechanically, you just believe that this is true. You're not trying to understand what is happening. You just believe that this is like some sort of formula, and some sort of a, a job which I need to just perform, no matter what is the underlying concept. So when you're very much mechanical, in your thought process, it means you don't have the organic feeling of the situation. You still you can get the answer with the, the understanding that what I'm supposed to write. So you're supposed to write the angular momentum of the disk, which will have two components, spin and orbital. 
you need to realize that do we have spin do we have orbital you need to ask yourself and then you add the value if you come across a particle think of only orbital and the formula for orbital just keep in mind it's mvr where v and r are mutually perpendicular if velocity and r are not mutually perpendicular take one of the components either v normal to the r or r normal to the v take any one of them and then just write the answer <coughs> is this clear yes sir so how many of you have realized the angular impulse angular momentum theorem approach to solve the same problem Maybe very less. So we can practice. <clears throat> so let's see some more challenging problem. Now this is the series of problems that you will encounter in SC Verma. So all the last 10, 20 questions are based on the same concept, just it's blind method of applying the formula and do it. So almost all problems of SC Verma can solve in just one line. Conservation of angle momentum. So the last page of SC Verma is only based on that. So let's say we have a maybe what you want to say is sphere or disk or what So you can call it any. So tell me your choice. Yeah, I'm giving you guys choice. You want this as a disc ring, hollow sphere, solid sphere, what? Hollow sphere. Okay, let's see for the time now. Let's say this is hollow sphere, like a ball. And what you do is you throw the ball on a rough surface with velocity v naught and no omega. So you don't give any spin, you just throw it. And the rough surface having the coefficient of friction, mu. I'm just adding mu, mu k and the mu s will be same. And now because this is the velocity given to the hollow sphere v naught and there is no spin now you can analyze for yourself the bottom will try to go forward or backward the backward bottom will try to go backward why you're throwing forward no If you throw something forward, then why the bottom will go backward? I don't understand this concept. Because of friction will push it right in that direction, backward direction. The point will tend to move forward. And because the point of contact will tend to move forward, then the friction will develop backward. That is the idea. And because this will rub, or 
to scratch the surface, the friction will be kinetic friction. Now you can understand on your own that this friction and the other forces like normal gravity about center of mass, which force can create torque? Normal gravity. Friction. Pardon? Friction. SP. So the friction is the only force which can create the torque. So it will create the omega, right? It, because it is creating the alpha. So it will create the omega also over the time. Right? So now, what will happen to the velocity? Will it suppose, support the velocity or oppose the velocity? Support. Friction is supporting the velocity. Very good. How? The ball is thrown forward. Is it friction accelerating forward or backward? Mm -hmm. so backward. You need to to realize two things the rotational dynamics is separate and translation is <coughs> separate event and the two events should not uh, disturb each other so both events are separate when i talk about the translation motion i just analyze things which can increase the velocity of center mass or decrease the velocity of center mass clearly friction is going to be so decrease decelerating agent for the velocity part for center mass it is acting opposite of the velocity it will decrease so now there is something interesting happening the velocity i am decreasing but the omega i am increasing in a way i am decreasing the kinetic energy of rotation uh, translation but somewhat i am also increasing the kinetic energy of rotation <coughs> But because I'm the kinetic friction, so I will have the loss property. So the net energy I'm going to decrease for sure. So I may give you some value in one way, but I will take away more than what I'll give back. And that's why the net is always going to be negative. Because kinetic friction on this system will never do the positive work. So the idea is friction as an agent is responsible for two separate action and let's talk each action separately one is the translatory action and other is a rotatory action and do not be confused that friction as an agent can do the two jobs separately at the same time yeah it's possible so in terms of velocity it is decreasing the v naught but it is helping in achieving omega so now a moment will come in its journey that this hollow sphere will decrease the velocity from v not to a lesser value v but at the same time it will increase the omega from zero to some value omega and this process will continue for some time not a moment because v naught is decreasing and omega is increasing so there must be a moment when the two will become equal at that instant when this will happen let's call this t equals to t and let's call this as t equals to zero at this instant suddenly the bottom will come to a rest and the friction will vanish what happens after that is the inertia. So you just move because of your own inertia forward. The inertia carries you forward. And friction is non-zero. And this inertia will keep you moving forward forever. In real life, this doesn't happen because of some practical reason. So in real life, nothing is permanently rigid. So the balls are not perfectly circular it's uh, 
closer to the bottom is someone flat then and also when you move some spherical object on a surface the surface also get dent and it creates a, a bulge surface like this and now this bulge surface creates a normal reaction in this fashion and the normal will have a component in the backward direction and this will slow down eventually bring you at rest no matter even friction is zero this normal can bring you at rest so in the reality if you throw something even on a very flat surface eventually it comes to rest because the perfect rigidity is not possible so everything no matter however hard it may appear to you will have some deformative property which leads to the stop now this kind of opposition or this kind of resistance to stop the body is actually called rolling friction so the rolling friction has nothing to do with the rolling motion as perceived by many rolling friction is a property of surface and it is due to the deformative property of surface or you can say the the lack of perfect rigidness and that's why the ob every object which you throw on a real surface will eventually stop no matter how smooth you make it so this friction is called rolling friction but this is not what we have been in our syllabus the rolling friction is not part of any discussion yeah one should know it as a practical information but that's enough so now coming back to our discussion what we are discussing here is that a hollow sphere is thrown forward and i am exactly trying to find that up to what time the friction will cease to act or in a way after what time the pure rolling begins so here after time p since projection of ball the pure rolling So after time t, since projection of ball, the pure rolling begins, and now you can see something very interesting. If you can solve organically, and now how we solve organically? So organic method is always the impulse momentum theorem, and angular impulse momentum theorem. Both you have to apply individually, separately. Impulse momentum theorem is a way to deal with the linear values, or you can say the translatory values, and it is only pertaining to the center mass to body it has nothing to do with the body as a whole so when i am trying to write the linear impulse momentum theorem i treat body as a particle and i just see the things just like what i would have seen for a particle and when i apply the angular momentum theorem the angular impulse angular momentum theorem i see only as a body i ignore the translation and what i do is i just calculate the torque i mean the angular impulse about center of mass so if you keep these two ideas in your mind and if you attempt the problem the chance is very very high to get the correct answer without much thinking so let me show you the organic way and then of course we'll do by the the conservation of so called angular momentum conservation is not at all required you can do it always organically this is how i do but as a part of the course teaching we should know the the conservation method also and always remember conservation is just a method to attack a problem from a different approach or point of view but the basic always remains the same and the basic is laws of motion i mean you cannot go beyond laws of motion in your life so let me write down the angular uh, impulse momentum theorem so i'll start with the impulse momentum theorem 
and impulse momentum theorem is written for center mass so when we have a particle then we write for particle but when we have a body we write for the center mass so when we have body then we write for cm for particle we know what to write for body you write for center mass well it's very easy so what is the linear momentum in the very beginning what is the momentum of the body as a whole mv not is pretty simple now the impulse is defined as force into time it's as simple so in time t the impulse will take away the momentum because it's opposing and you're left with mv so question one just So now this is a very simple you can see that the impulse momentum theorem is pretty easy to apply i mean you should not be scared because it's a body you just think this is a particle and write the stuff which you know now coming back to the angular impulse angular momentum theorem now this is interesting now this we always apply always write about cm and i have told you it's not that we cannot apply about other point the thing is it will be just too cumbersome for you so let's write for about the center mass about center mass what was the initial angular momentum i think it was zero because there was no spin correct about center mass the only angular momentum we have is spin and there is no spin so this is zero now friction will add some value and what is the value r f k is the torque in a way and this torque has been acting for time t i am taking from beginning to end and in over the time t this has created the angular impulse uh, angular momentum of value I see moment, and now we are done because we have the two mathematical values. So if you multiply the first equation with R and if you add the equation two, what you get is exactly called the conservation of angular momentum. So one into r plus two implies. If you want to do that way, or if you if you want to substitute it, up to you. So M V not minus F K T four into r is equal to M V R. And F K T into r is equal to I C M of the disk into uh, omega. And if you add these two questions, this will cancel out. And what you are getting is m v not r. Now this is exactly the angular momentum about the bottom most point of the rigid body. In the very beginning, there is no spin, so we only have the orbital. And it is the answer about the bottom point, which you will realize later on. And this equals to m v r, which is because of the orbital nature, plus plus 
after some time it will also gain some spin value and this is quite logical that the initial we do not have any spin so we just have the orbital value and uh, later on we have the spin and orbital both so you can see that two terms and we can what you can realize that when we were writing the individual values the friction was the the only agent creating all these changes so now friction can produce torque about center mass but at the same time friction cannot produce torque about bottom isn't it if i choose any point on the surface friction will never create torque because the line of action of force will be passing through the any point on the surface isn't it and because normal and gravity are balancing out each other therefore they are acting as a couple force so they will create again zero torque about any other o any other point which you consider the whole idea is the choice of any point on the surface on which the body is rolling will make sure that angular momentum about that point the body will never change it means it will gain something it will do something but the net will remain same as before and what you need to realize that it is the any point on the bottom on the surface which will keep the angular momentum conserved so about center mass it is changing because friction was able to create okay so the moment you switch to the bottom you can write the conservation of angular momentum so the other method is this what you call conservation of angular momentum but to write the conservation principle you need to first search for the the right choice of the axis about which this is possible So now the right choice of the axis is here, the bottom. Normally we take bottom, but you can take anywhere on the surface. And why this is so? Because of the obvious reason: if you throw forward with velocity v naught, the forces are very much obvious. The friction will act backward. The normal will act upward, and the gravity will also pass through this. So if you extend the line of gravity mg and because all forces passing through the bottom this is the point about which none of the force can create torque so what we can say that the torque about any axis passing through o i mean this is just axis actually but i'm writing o this is zero this implies angular momentum is conserved about o in fact it is conserved about any point on the surface need not to be o so after a while when the body starts a pure rolling when the velocity of the the ball and the omega are in the complete sync everything the friction comes zero the normal will remain and the gravity but that's okay but the friction becomes zero no friction will act and let's say this happens exactly after time t so now you are supposed to write the angular momentum of the body about the base so l not initial is l not final and it's it's very easy so in the very beginning ask yourself what is the orbital what is the spin and you'll get the answer because bottom is r distance away from the center of mass it is m v not r plus nothing no spin zero but after a while it is pure only okay so you know what to write
isn't it? I not omega. Yeah. So what you can write here now? So finally, you can write there are two terms or one term. There will be two term or one term. Two terms or one term. Tell me, like how many types of angular momentum the body will have eventually? Only spin, only orbital, or both? Am I audible, guys? No, only spin. Eventually, the body will have only spin. This is what you are saying. I not So the center mass is having no velocity. You are saying that center mass is at rest. Eventually, the center mass will move with velocity v. It is not at rest. So about the bottom, it will have the orbital for sure. That will be m v r. And because it is having omega, so it will be having the value I C M omega. But because it's a pure only motion, so the two terms is not necessary. You could have written directly. So in case of pure only, the net, the net angular momentum about the bottom, you can write directly because the bottom itself is I C R. So you can just write as. Uh, it's a hollow sphere. Yeah, we should have solved this. I mean, this is interesting. The MVR, the V is omega R itself. And ICM is 2 by, it's hollow, not 3. So 2 by 3 MI square is of a hollow. And uh, this will become uh, pi by 3 m omega r square is m v not r. So the omega final is how much? 3 v not by omega r is 3 v not by y. So the velocity is omega. So the final velocity is 3 v naught by 5. But what we're looking for is the time. So you can find the time using the either first equation or the second equation from here. So that's why this method is more interesting. So now here we can write as 2 by 3 m i square plus <coughs> m i square. <clears throat> into omega, that's the diagram. So there are many ways to solve that. It's up to you. So when it is slipping, then you should not apply the the I C R omega. You cannot write the two term as single term. But when whenever there is a pure only motion, always remember you can write the two term as single term given by the value I C M uh, I I C R into omega. And this will give you the answer directly. But the actual question was after what time this will happen? Like you throw. But after what time this will happen? So now you can see that it is pretty easy to solve using this formula or this formula. I mean, this formula. Because you know V, you know V naught, and the T you know, I mean T you want to find, and FK you know. So the friction force is pretty simple. It's mu mg, correct? But N is equal to mg here in this case. So for time calculation, what do you connect?
So for time calculation, we can simply say mv not minus fk t equals to mv and uh, we can rearrange this as t by 5 mv so the t turns out to be 2 v not by 5 mu so they will ask you to find the time after which something like this will happen. Now you're not supposed to just add a, uh, this kinematic, I mean, this uh, impulse moving from to get the answer. You can also use your basic kinematical equation because, because you know the, the final velocity and from loss of motion, it will have the retardation, which is equal to mu minus mu g, I mean, mu g as a value. You could have written the directly v equals to u plus a t and v was 3 v naught by 5 u was v naught a was minus mu g and t. So the, this is organic way, this is the using kinematic regulation and solving will give you the same answer. So now you know various <coughs> so various ways to attempt the question uh, of this nature. So let me give you one more problem and then probably this is very interesting. So I'm just trying to generalize uh, a, a wide variety of problem in one single problem. So this is some sort of object which I will not name anything. So in this case, I'm going to take the ICM equals to MK square. MK square. Okay. So what we are do, going to do is, this is called the question of reverse spin. So we throw forward, but while throwing, we give a reverse spin. So I don't know how many of you have done this, but I used to do a lot with my MP Wix, the what is it, small one, the flat one. So earlier the Wix vapor used to come in a tin box. A very thin tin box and once it is empty then it was the biggest uh, toy for me to play with i was not in that eventually it will become part of my teaching as a small kid i used to play by giving a reverse spin and throwing forward so it used to come back so although you throw forward but because of the sufficient friction it will come back to you so you might have done this anyone was done this? Yes. Hopefully, some of you. So now today uh, we are going to do the same question, but purely mathematically, like how this is possible. So I want to know the condition between the v naught and omega naught, like what reverse angular speed we must impart, so that it should come back. That's the idea. And it's pretty easy. So what we'll do is to find the condition for uh, whether it will come back or whether it will move forward or whether it will come to rest, we can do easily by finding that which of the two value becomes zero first. Now imagine the situation when Omega has become zero because of the obvious reason that friction is acting backward, as you can see. The bottom is trying to go forward to friction like backward. And so it will create the torque which will oppose the omega. 
So they say omega becomes zero, but the velocity is still remains the same. So in this case, omega is zero, but velocity is there. So friction will act <coughs> this way only, and velocity is left with some value, not zero, some new value v. And because the friction is acting backwards, what will happen? It will create the omega this way, and eventually it will move forward. And will keep on moving forward forever because this is the same as the first scenario. This question: you give velocity but no spin, so it goes forward and then it starts pure rolling and then goes forever forward. So if I create a situation like this, if omega becomes zero but not the v, then this is same as the first case, right? So it will go further ahead and then will start pure rolling. And then it will continue forever in the forward direction. So this is not the case. Then uh, what I am looking for that will come back to. I mean, come back to what? The other case may be like this. What is that? The other case is this object has lost the velocity completely. The velocity of the center mass is now zero, but omega is still there. Backward spin is there, but this is not omega, not its omega. Now, because the bottom is trying to go forward, friction will still act backward. <coughs> but because the center is at rest, so this friction will give a backward motion to the center mass. Now, this is exactly the case what I was looking for. I want for the backward. I mean, to bring it back, the rule is simple. The spin given should be very high compared to the velocity, so that eventually the friction will bring it back. So let's do this problem. So what we do is to solve this problem. To solve. Okay. Or in fact, we have to know whether the object will uh, move backward. Or forward after a while, we check the time that it will take to make. Vcm zero and omega zero. So just let's take separately. So I can find the Vcm zero very easily using the simple fund of impulse momentum theorem. So I can say that m v not minus f k t. Let's call it T1. Equals to zero. So I can get T1 is how much? That's it. And for the omega, the initial angular momentum is I C M omega naught. F K into R is the torque. T2 is the time it will apply for, and then it will make it zero. So T2 turns out to be. I C M omega naught by F K R. This is a very simple equation that you can easily derive. So when V is zero, when omega is zero, and now we have to just compare the answers. So maybe I can do here or next.
So the first one is object will eventually come to rest. So the answer is simple that T1 equals to T2 because if the V and omega both become zero at the same time, then it will never move forward or backwards, it will remain at rest forever. So that means the M V not by FK is I C M by FK I C M omega. Okay. So now this will cancel out. And then you have to write something interesting. M V not I C M connect as M K square. So V naught by omega naught will have a relation k square by r, which I will, I will write as k square by r square into r. So if V naught by omega naught is exactly equal to this ratio into r, it will come to rest. Okay. Now object will come backward. Object will, I mean, eventually move backward. Object will return back. So for return back condition, the omega should take more time to stop than the velocity. So I can say T1 must be less than T2, correct? Which means the V naught by omega naught should be less than object never returns and keep on moving for that t1 should be more than t2 less so this is a very very important uh, concept uh, from the point of view of uh, computation and knowing this will help you in solving question without much effort you know the condition already in advance so let me give you some idea. So I'll go back to my childhood and play with the same width pin. And I'll consider that as a, a disc or maybe as a, a thin cylinder. So let's say this is cylinder. Because the blue is a significant color for the Wix uh, jar, maybe green. Yeah, blue is also there. So to remiss the childhood, I'll say Wix. So imagine this is like a cylinder. And while throwing it forward, I give a back spin in the hope that it will come back. And of course, friction is present. That's always there. So, because it's a cylinder, so V naught by omega naught should be less than K square by R square. And you know that K square by R square is nothing but the the coefficient of the formula of the moment of inertia. So for moment of inertia of the disk, it is half m i squared, half is the answer. That's simple. Which means if you throw the disk with velocity which is less than omega naught r by 2, it will come back. 
and if you throw more than this it will go forward if you throw exactly equal it will go forward it will come to this and that's it so let's say if i give you that uh, this is omega naught and this is uh omega naught r uh, by four. now the question is will it come back yes or no the answer yes. is yes it's because the value i have taken is less than what you, they should have as per the formula so you can directly apply this method uh, for any question and you'll get the answer so now this kind of question is quite common and uh, what they ask is generally the time after which the pure rolling starts you just find the <coughs> v equals to omega condition and uh, either solve by the kinematical equation for the center mass or you write the impulse momentum theorem for center mass in either case you get the time duration easily for rolling object on a flat surface conservation should be applied about the bottom because about the bottom there is no torque due to any of the forces which we know so we will take one different question now from what we have been discussing so far and this is called impact problem so the sick collision problem So now whenever we have the impact problem like the question that we did in the last lecture in which the cube was moving and it bumped upon a obstacle a tiny obstacle the impact creates impulsive force and impulsive force are very powerful so they have the power to change the angular momentum about it. any other point even in a very short duration let's call dt time but they cannot create torque about the point where they act because the distance from the point of action of those forces is zero it means in case of impact problem we must conserve the <coughs> angular momentum about the point of impact because we know that the impulsive force will be developed during the impact but that will never create the torque about that point itself now we may have some non impulsive torque and impulsive torque so if the non impulsive torque is also present about the impact point the non impulsive torque cannot bring a big change in momentum angular momentum in a short duration they need some time to make the change like the question that we just solved in which i wrote fk into t or r fk into t because it's a big time t so in the time t the friction can change the angular momentum slowly slowly <laughs> but in the time dt only impulsive torque can change <coughs> the non impulsive torque cannot change in small duration and therefore in most of the impact problem or collision problem you are free to conserve the angular momentum about the point of impact even in the presence of external torque but for a very short duration because in short duration non impulsive torque cannot bring any significant change clear
Hello, guys. Am I audible to you? Yes, sir. Clear, yes, sir. So, this is the first one. This is a flat surface, but there is a ramp. This ramp makes an angle theta. We have some maybe a This is moving performing the pure rolling motion with velocity v naught and omega was exactly v naught by r. So it's a pure rolling condition. After the once it will hit the ramp, it will start climbing up the ramp. Assuming there is no bouncing event happening here. After the hitting the ramp, it starts climbing. Then, what will be its velocity of center mass just after it starts climbing the ramp? Find velocity of center mass Okay, so you can assume that E equals to zero is perfectly inelastic collision. So can you try this sum? Oh, okay, let me try this. So we'll so, try some. Okay. Then So first you need to look for the impact point by drawing the <coughs> geometry. So the impact point will be this point. So the point of impact is that uh, we are looking for is here. This is where it will hit. So now your question is simple. Can we conserve the angular momentum about that impact point? Just and also you need to realize that the moment you hit the plane, the center mass will move in this direction with a new velocity v and angular velocity omega. Such that v is omega. So we are considering enough friction is there. Okay. Tell me that.
So both the omega are same, no, no? No, no, they are different. I should have taken different symbol, but okay. Because pure volume, so both will change simultaneously. <laughs> so you are supposed to write the angular momentum just before collision, about the impact, and uh, just after collision, <coughs> about the impact. That's it.
after I got transfer. Yes, how much? Three V naught by two cos theta plus one. So this is the sphere, right? What we have considered the sphere or something else? Sir, I took cylinder. No problem. So, in the very beginning, because this is theta, this will be also theta. And so, the in the very beginning, the velocity is like this. And the distance from the impact is only r cos theta. So, the orbital angular momentum about the impact is m v naught r cos theta. But definitely it will have the spin, which is mr square by two because you are taking a cylinder into omega naught. Now after it is starts climbing the the ramp, the angular momentum we can <coughs> directly write about the bottom, <coughs> and that is. Uh, V by two m r square because that small difference about bottom to omega. Okay, and then we're done. So V not cos theta plus omega not r is V not. So this is V not by two, and omega is V. And then we got three V equals to. Two v not cos theta plus v naught. So v turns out to be three. Uh, v naught by three. Yeah. And that's very much meaningful. That if I make theta equal to zero, the answer is very much clear, right? It is exactly v naught because it will continue moving. In the same direction. So whenever you have the impact from the simple idea is don't think much. Uh, conserve the angular momentum about the <coughs> about the impact. And now we have something called uh, it's a part of impact problem, but uh, with subtle difference. <coughs> So what we do here is here we have the collision between the particle and the body. So we know how to do the question of collision of the particles, uh, point masses. But here we have things different. So collision between particle. And body. Basically, this is the, exactly the question of the cricket match in which the ball is the particle and the bat is the, the body. Because considering the size of the bat, the ball is uh, negligible in terms of dimension. And not negligible, but yeah, it's small enough. So we'll study about the impact that what happens if a, a tiny ball, let's not take the cricket ball, maybe some and by using the cricket ball, I mean bat, if you use the uh, the table tennis ball that is small, yeah. It's, it's small. So, in such case, uh, how to deal with the problem? So, we have two separate variety of problems, we call it stick ball problems, and these are the basis of uh, J advanced problem. So, you will see that the variety of question in J advanced has been asked in which we have a plank and some particles are hitting the plank, or maybe the ball hitting the plank, and so on. So, we always have the bat and ball problem in physics a lot. So we call it stick ball problem. And it will have two varieties. We'll see it later on in the next lecture. So it is going to be a rigorous analysis. And that analysis will take care of the entire 
physics concept that we have used so far. So we'll use the coefficient of restitution definition. We'll use the conservation of linear momentum. We'll use the conservation of angular momentum. We'll also use the impulse momentum theorem. We also use the concept of hinges and all. This is going to be quite rigorous, and then I'll explain what is called the flip shot. We must have heard the flip shot in cricket jargon. So, what is the mathematical meaning of this? I'll explain. And you will also learn about uh, how to put the stopper on your door. So what is the mechanism of the right method to put the door stopper? So, you will be a better designer of stuff at your home. You can guide, guide the carpet a little bit to put the door stopper to have the best impact and least impact on the hinges because we want that the hinges of the door should be intact and therefore we want to minimize the the impact we develop to where while the door is stopped. All those questions we'll answer after learning the stick ball problem in the next episode. Till then, goodbye. Bye, sir.